Okay, uh, I have a few announcements to make. First is that um, despite Gene's objections, we printed an evaluation form. <laughs> <laughs> we would like your feedback on the conference. Um, you know, the first question is, uh, what is the food good at dinner? Should the, should the volume have been higher or lower on the conversation? Questions like that. So fill it out and give it, return it to Gene, unless you have bad things to say about Gene, and then return it either to me or Bob directly. Uh, so we'll pass this around. Uh, take one. The uh, second announcement is that because of poor management by the session chair yesterday afternoon, not to mention Bob or anybody else, Connie's uh, discussion period was cut short, and so we're going to we're going to uh, cobble together a discussion section on her topic at lunch, and so Connie the, will not eat lunch and talk <laughs> and lecture while the rest of us eat lunch. But I will dodge all the food That's right. Uh, and then the third announcement is that if you look on the agenda, you notice that there's something that says Yuri's Night at 6 p.m. That is not part of this conference. It is a completely separate activity. It's organized by George, it was originally organized by George Whiteside and his wife, Loretta Hildalgo. Uh, and it's not just at Ames, it's all over the world. There's parties to celebrate the t anniversary of Darien's first flight into space. And the purpose of it is to engage young people in space activities. It happens to be tonight coincidence with this, coincident with this workshop. It starts at 6 p.m. And the highlight of it is at 7.30, I think, uh, Anoush Asari, the woman, the Iranian woman who flew into space, will be giving a talk. And she's emerged as quite a uh, figure in this whole discussion, more so than any of the other space tourists. She, seemed to, uh, she seems to be doing uh, interesting stuff with her, with her uh, position in the resulting from space flight. So she'll be there. And then there's a bunch of uh, science and art stuff that goes till 6 a.m. So if you're up for a late night, uh, feel free. Where is there? There is the NASA hangar, 211. And I, I think you have to actually buy tickets. So they're, they're not a lot, but you know, buy tickets. But I think you can just, you all should have badges that allow you access through the main NASA gates. Uh, if you don't, you can pick them up at the visitor center or just see me and I'll figure it, figure it out if you want to get in. But you can, I think tonight they will have public access to the hangar 211. So you'll be able to go there, and uh, if you if you wish to uh, to do that, they are they were planning for 3,000 people. They as of yesterday they had sold 1,000 tickets, so there might be a crowd starting to flow away at around uh, 6 p.m. So, uh, okay. Were there any other uh, official announcements? Oh, question. Excuse me. What are the rules between 6 and 7:30? At Yuri's night. Um, there's a, there is a food there. They have a restaurant at the end of the universe, and they have uh, you know, a couple other things. Um, George, if George Whiteside shows up, I'll have him uh, discuss what they're doing. And if he doesn't show up, just before lunch, I'll post the agenda. I have the agenda from the meeting for the, for the night, and I'll post it on the screen. Okay, but I have the agenda, and I'll show it at just before lunch in conflict with Connie's talk yet again. <laughs> no. All right. Uh, so with that, I want to start the session, um, and uh, I want to introduce the first speaker, who's Penny Boston, who I have known Penny since I was 17 years old, uh, for sure. And we have worked together on and off on uh, so many things I can't count them. And uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce her. Penny is... Uh, is sort of the biology part of uh, an interaction that we've had. My background is physics, her background is biology, and we've interacted in that mode for so many years that it, it has to be measured in millennium, not <laughs> year, decades even. And so it's a producer, and she's going to talk about extraterrestrials. So Penny Boston. <laughs> should we clap or should we not clap? Um, you know, when, when Jean asked me to uh, participate in this meeting a few years ago, being the delusional individual I am, I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then I didn't hear from him for, you know, some really long period of time, and I figured, oh, you know, one of those many things that just 
hasn't come to fruition, and it had dropped off my event horizon. And then um, I heard from him, what, I don't know, some number of months ago, and I'm like, oh, I have to do something about this. So, you know, giving science talks is easy. You stand up and you talk about what you do and what you did. Uh, but this was a lot more challenging. And because really I focus on the small and slimy, this is some of my life's work here, as you can see, um, instead of the really cute organisms on the planet, um, it, it, it reawakened my interest in thinking about what is the role of um, ethical behavior with respect to life per se as a phenomenon rather than life as individual organisms to which one can relate. Um, I am very warm and fuzzy about slimy things and small things and so forth. I, uh, of course, am emotionally bonded to them the way that one uh, ought to emotionally bond to work. Um, but I realize that this, this attitude is not shared in general amongst people. Mostly people relate to microorganisms as either um, disease agents or they're essentially invisible and irrelevant. And of course, scientifically this is not true because they do a great deal of what goes into running the planet. Oh my god, this light is blinding. <laughs> Yikes, it's like an eye test. Um, but in terms of their, their utility for people, their, uh, their, pro their PR profile is either poor or non-existent. So it's always difficult to figure out how to make people care about these. Now, really, I have to be upfront about this and that I am really very pessimistic about ethics. And I think that uh, it's very difficult to take the position that we, by and large, actually behave in in any consistent fashion with an ethical framework, except perhaps on an individual basis. Um, we discuss things a great deal, especially in countries where we have a lot of uh, food and a lot of uh, leisure time to discuss them. But in the main, especially large numbers of us, we tend to uh, override any ethical considerations in the behavior that we exhibit. But make me give up because uh, I really have a very low, a flat learning curve, which is actually what got me through graduate school probably, and um, uh, keeps me plugging away at many things that are difficult to do and probably fruitless, including trying to get humans off the surface of this planet into another one. So I don't learn very quickly in response to negative stimuli. So I still want to uh, continue to think about it, but really in my heart of hearts, I believe that we absolutely fail to exercise control over ourselves. Um, partly, I don't blame us because we're biological entities and that's the way evolution uh, develops systems. And I think that we will probably be no better at applying ethics to the extraterrestrial realm than we have ever been, with the caveat that certain things may change. So I can't in the abstract, imagine that we, we might be able to create mechanisms where those mechanisms themselves, whatever they are, could cause us to behave in a different way than we normally do. And if we were clever enough, we could dev devise those mechanisms to actually funnel us in the direction of collectively ethical behavior. But I really can't see how to design those, of course, at this point. Um, certainly, fierce things with big teeth make you do things. But other than that, um, how do you recreate human thought and perhaps even human biology to push humans in the direction of greater ethical behavior? So while I was preparing this, I was thinking, what is the biological basis of moral behavior? And I, I really have a very simplistic view, but I actually think it's founded in reality. We relate to other organisms depending on whether they're cute or not cute. And, uh, you know, this is a trivial statement of what we all know. And we all feel, because we're optimized to respond to the cute. And this is a good thing, because it's intimately involved in parental behavior. And in fact, social and tribal behavior, which is more than simply the interaction of a wolf pack, although you can see the beginnings of this kind of uh, interactive ethical behavior there. And so with this kind of biology, it isn't surprising that we eventually reach the point at which 
with our large uh, cognitively complex forebrains, we would actually begin to uh, behave in an even more complicated way in the moral and ethical realm. One of the other major developments in understanding the biological basis of, of morality and ethical behavior really uh, has come about in the last 10 years, as far as I can tell. And this has to do with things called mirror neurons. And mirror neurons fire not only when you yourself as an organism perform some action or have some response, but they also fire when you witness another organism doing the same thing. So this gives you, the, this is the biological window into empathy. You can experience at some level what another organism is experiencing because your nervous system is essentially firing in concert with it. And to me, this is a, the most exciting thing. Now, it doesn't last very long as this shows. Um, we have a very transient response to this in most cases. Um, I ask sure. Is there any reason that you could not reverse the causal arrows right there? And the reason that, let me turn it around and say the reason that it fires, that part of your neuron net in your brain fires, is because you're feeling empathy. Oh, exactly. And so this, we don't have to see this as a kind of biological determinism, right? But rather, I don't believe in biological determinism. I do believe in biological mechanism enabling a vastly greater array of outcomes. Um, I. I I think what you're saying is, can you feel the empathy in the absence of witnessing another organism? No, I'm, I'm making the point that we don't have to see the biology driving the psychology. We could just as easily explain this scientifically by the psychology driving the biology or as these things co-determining one another. Well, as yeah. It's a, uh, it causal er deterministic causal era, uh, arrow from biochemistry to biology to psychology to ethics here that I wanted to challenge. Sure, and I think that you can make the case that it's as intimately connected as hardware and software. I mean, you, you can't have psychology if you have no physical basis for it to occur. But on the other hand, psychological responses clearly do feed back into the biology. In fact, there's some interesting work that's been done lately on um, experience creating the biological fundamentals that go into um, um, enabling or, or, or pushing people in the direction of, of uh, depression, for example, bipolar depression. So we know that the environment, of course, interacts with it. But I'm trying to get at what is the biological basis so that I can look at that level of organization and say, is there anything that we can do ourselves that would alter some of these basic truths? And what, what does the um, basis of biology tell us about? Quick clarification. When you say those mirror neurons fire, when others do the same thing, what's the same thing? Uh, whatever it is that your neuron would be firing, if, you, if your mirror neuron is capable of a range of firing in response to a range of stimuli, when you witness that range of stimuli, you your, the same neuro neurological apparatus fires. Okay, so uh, okay. This is why we cry at stimulus movies. Us, other right. Okay. And obviously, this, I'm talking about this is a simple one-on-one. -on -one. You, you know, the worm sees another worm do something. I don't know if worms have mirror neurons. But obviously, we have elaborate arrays of uh, interaction that we do. So we cry at movies. We, um, we feel empathy for the hurt and so forth. And when, we, uh, when, when people who work in this field have tested humans in response to um, evocative, emotionally evocative um, um, movies or witnessing other uh, animals in pain or people in distress, these are the neurons that fire. So this... Do these neurons fire when you yawn? I've always wondered, why is it when one person yawns, everyone else yawns? I, I don't know. That's an interesting... I don't know about that particular instance. I haven't read, but maybe so. Maybe that's, that's a, a more trivial and, and more uh, simple version of what goes on. So, I mean, there's a lot of truth to the uh, adage, monkey see, monkey do, and there's a reason for that. The other er arena within pe which people have been considering the biological basis of moral behavior, of course, comes in the form of our close kin, our, our evolutionarily close kin. 
great apes and to some extent the monkeys. And Dewall at Emory is a very controversial figure um, in this arena, partly because he believes that um, our close kin behaves in a, um, in a way that is not, in essence, different from the way we emotionally perceive and the way we emotionally respond. And this is a great dichotomy in um, the world of animal behavior. There are people who somehow have reached the conclusion that all other uh, organisms besides us um, respond differently than us, a position that I find somewhat inconsistent um, with organic evolution as we understand it. He has written in a, in a book about 10 years ago that morality is as firmly grounded in neurobiology as anything else we do or are. Now, that doesn't mean that's the sum total of it. That's the mechanism that enables us to express this vast range of behaviors. He's pointed out that consolation, consoling a hurt or a damaged fellow, conspecific, is universal amongst all the great apes. And that is much less so, or in fact not apparent at all, amongst the monkeys. So something seems to have happened at that evolutionary divide. And we know genetically that there is a divide there. Um, in my long and sordid history, one thing that uh, most people don't know about me is that I also was a double major in philosophy as an undergraduate. So I have vague remembrances, of course, of some of the broad outlines of, of a lot of the great thinkers. And to oversimplify, and hopefully not to do too much violence to the position of Kant and Hume on these kinds of issues, but uh, Kant was certainly a rationalist in the sense that he believed that reason was the basis of morality. Uh, which puts it in the, the frontal lobe, in the cognitive realm of, of thinking. Whereas uh, David Hume really believed that the emotions were the foundation for this kind of, of human experience. And so I think that the biology can be said at this point to probably support the Humean, Humean humic uh, view rather than Kant. In a, a very interesting uh, series of papers starting in uh, uh, 97, about 10 years ago, Harnden Warwick actually claims that chimpanzees, uh, in various aspects of their social interaction, stop going away, stop going away, um, actually were exhibiting a morality-based interaction. That this was not simply um, social interaction in this more, um, more superficial way, but because chimpanzees, in, in his view are actually capable of empathy and a certain degree of self-awareness that this raised their interactions uh, across a whole level of different kinds of behaviors into the realm of actual moral and ethical behavior with respect to their conspecifics. We certainly know that the reverse is true, that they make war upon each other. So it's, it's somewhat heartening to think they have also the, the other side of their personalities as we do as a species. One of the fascinating things to me is the extremely close uh, genetic relationship between ourselves, between the chimpanzees, and between the other chimpanzees, the bonobos. Uh, bonobos and chimpanzees are very, very close. They're about 11% of their total genome different. This is not a great deal. It translates into essentially 50 genes. And they have many, many similarities in their physiology. They have many similarities in their blood chemistry. Uh, just about every metric that people have used to measure them, except they have radically different behavior. They have radically different behavior. Chimpanzees are exceedingly warlike and contentious. Um, they have a very different mating system. They, uh, they use uh, sex and mating rights uh, very much within a hierarchy of dominance. And they use that as a social tool, whereas the bonobos are about the most um, pacific of organisms. They interact very, very gently with one another. They use sex uh, and sexual relationship and 
that that implies as a social grease, essentially. So they have a very calm and almost, you might say, utopian idyllic existence compared to your average chimpanzee troop. Well, I think it's very hard to just look at the genetics and go, well, gosh, they're so different. And in fact, several workers have pointed out that possibly it's not really the genetics that has driven the vast differences in their behavior, but rather in that they tend to live in rather different environments. And those environments impose very different ecological relationships on the different groups. And that that difference is responsible for their differences in behavior, which are across the entire spectrum of the behaviors come back, that they exhibit. And so thus, the genetic difference that we see between bonobos and chimpanzees be a result of the behavioral changes, which is what I'm trying to get to with all of this long discussion. Penny, what are the three percentage numbers? Um, this is the difference between um, humans and bonobos. I know I ran out of space, I'm sorry. And 2% is the difference between chimpanzees and humans. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, Wanda. The, the ecology, you say, that uh, where they dwell has some... Uh, yes, I mean, they dwell... Tell me the, the difference, uh, they dwell in areas where, although they can um, search for food, there's more competition. They're in direct competition with baboons, which is another element that has been pointed out. Yes, the chimpanzees. The bonobos are smaller, and they live in an area where uh, food is very free-flowing and they're rarely stressed in terms of acquiring nutrition. It's not true with the chimpanzees. Chimpanzees tend to live in ecotonal regions where, they're, where several ecosystem types come together. And th those tend to be ecologically higher energy areas and a larger amount of niche space, right? So it's a more contentious environment. Whether or not that's true, I don't know, but the point is that very, very tiny genetic differences may be inconsequential, and that it may be the environment, and you may be able to see this in our close relatives. This is not really that big news. If you look at the spectrum of human behavior across the planet, it, it comes in a staggering array. I mean, it's amazing that we are all um, the same species, and we behave so very differently in response to the environment. So the question then is, is something that uh, could be considered the foundation of ethical behavior. That is a more um, benign culture of the bonobos versus a more um, obstreperous uh, culture of the chimpanzees. Actually something that's tunable in us. Are these tunable properties? That means if you, if you put humans in certain conditions or create certain conditions for us, will we respond in any consistent way in a direction that we would like to see ourselves go. Well, this is not a new idea either. I mean, this is really the fundamentals behind social engineering, I'm sure. We're not very Well, if you take all of this uh, fundamental mechanism of the biological basis of moral behavior, you can do very elaborate things with it. And I happen to be very interested in uh, Locke's interpretation of social contract theory and how you create a government that actually you vest yourself in, in some sense. And when you look at a bonobo civilization, if we want to call it that, they essentially do the same thing. They really have a Lockean social contract theory amongst themselves, and this enables them to operate in a way that minimizes stress, minimizes strife, minimizes uh, mortality that they inflict on each other, and keeps them in a fairly harmonious uh, relationship to their environment. So what is our track record so far personally as humans? We, we know what we should do. I mean, this is the eternal human struggle. We all struggle with it all the time. Um, many of our, our thought systems and ethical systems get at some aspect of this. Um, we want to care for our conspecifics and particularly those who are, are more helpless. And this has come to extend to especially in developed nations where we have the, the luxury to behave in an ethical way beyond our own tribal groups, to care for other animals and, and to care for the earth. And so we know what we should do. It's 
really a matter of nailing that down, but what we actually do is very depressing, and I won't dwell on this, but really uh, our track record is, is the cause of my pessimism, and we do not brush and floss regularly. So it's no big surprise, though. I mean, with the other half of my brain, I'm a biologist. I know it's, you know, nature red in tooth and claw, at least part of the time. And the question is, we have a deep 3.8 billion or something like that by investment as, as organisms. This is not something that you can just talk yourself out of very quickly, right? We, we are biological products. We have arisen within the, not, the unethical constraints of a system that <coughs> evolves. Um, and the question is now arising whether we as a species have actually experienced something called ecological release. That is, have we released ourselves from the normal operation of organic evolution because we're big, big brain smart creatures. Many people have written that this is the case, and particularly as we get into this um, hyper-technological age in which we now find ourselves. But people have argued that we have been doing this for most of the time that we've had culture and civilization. That culture and civilization is not some um, <coughs> trivial add-on to the biology. That culture and civilization is so fundamentally uh, important in changing our environment that we have been for the last 10,000 years, as Pinker writes in that second um, uh, clip there, we have been mostly responding to our own culture and civilization biologically for the last 10,000 years. And that the natural selections that have uh, gone making us up as a species prior to that actually didn't quite cease, but became vastly less important at that time. This quote, maybe gets a little bit, Robert, what you were talking about. I mean, what is the interaction between the biological and genetic mechanisms and what's going on in the sociology and civilization and culture and psychology of the organisms? Well, psychology is part of your ecology. It's part of your environment. Your psyche acts on you just like um, uh, any other selector would act on you. And this is something that's hard to uh, think about in those terms because we experience it. Technology and culture, of course, allows us to do an end run and change ourselves because we have this plastic thing called civilization uh, that enables us to behave in ways that we could never behave in uh, over short periods of time if we simply had to evolve in the usual way. Whether or not culture and civilization actually constitutes a driver that is resulting in punctuated equilibrium in our species, might, one might argue. One might argue that we, over 10,000 years, which is a geologically insignificant time, have changed so radically that if you could preserve behavior in the fossil record and people were looking at it 100 million years from now, um, that we would see a significant difference. Maybe, maybe we will, because we create artifacts as a byproduct of that. And I'm not even going to go into the genetic engineering issues, because we all know that genetic engineering potentially may allow us the ability to change ourselves even more radically and even better. Yeah. Uh, that was oh. um, the, the Stephen Pinker quote there. Yeah. I think perfectly right to talk about the past 10,000 years, maybe I'd say 9,000, that there was a wild, extreme change in Earth's surface environment. Oh, the absolutely. Of the last ice age. Yes, it's true. And, uh, right. When you're, when you're seeking drivers, sure. you need to think about the environmental change. I agree. Technology doesn't arise de novo out of nothing. And it arises into it, it arises, I think, and advances with environmental challenges. And so and I agree. And it most technologies prosper in people being able to see seeing nomads and settle down somewhere. Sure. Urbanization, sure. agriculture special specialization, etc. Climate so. is never ignorable and it and it's often the more distal driver. So I would say I guess that the uh, climate changes and the change 
ecology of the regions within which humans were operating was the, was the distal driver and the creation of the technology was a more proximal driver um, as a consequence of the more distal. Potts. Potts. Is he the is he the person who uh, published the seventy thousand year uh, seventy thousand year large volcanic eruption major uh, genetic bottleneck work? Someone has published that in the last uh, two years, um, claiming and I think with significant uh, um, backing that because we are relatively homogeneous genetically as a species in the more deeply conserved regions that matter, that actually show lineage rather than hypervariable regions that you know, change more easily, that we actually went through what, what's called a genetic bottleneck, like many organisms have. And, and, and this person, whose name escapes me, maybe it's the same guy, not, um, has argued um, convincingly, I think, that uh, a major volcanic eruption at about the 70, I think it was 70, might have been 80, thousand year ago time period um, so stressed our species that it was really a break point and that we sort of re-emerged from that. But that, that is why a lot of the similarities that we have in blood chemistry um, have so little diverged. Yeah? That's the kind of mechanism that strengthens pathogens. <laughs> Subject them to uh, a treatment or an environment that kills 99% sure. of them. Sure. Sure. It strengthens anything biologically. I mean, it's either you do or die, right? If you go through a bottleneck, you either survive and come out the other side or you don't. Well, bring on the next asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I'm getting at, or my question to you, David. It's like, really, I don't know. You know, who knows? I mean, I'm very schizophrenic, aren't we all? I mean, one half of my brain is the science brain, and I hate to muck around with evolution because I kind of want to see what happens next. But then the other part is I have a daughter, and I plan to have grandchildren someday. <laughs> so I have the human side over here. So it's always been this, uh, this situation. Uh, life supplants life, and life does rotten things to other life. And, and so, you know, this should be no surprise. This is a cartoon that I had my friend Gus Frederick do for me a while ago. For those of you who aren't scientists, uh, you know, one of the big events in the history of Earth and life and the interaction of the two was the rise of free oxygen. And I think there's a powerful message in, in this uh, silly cartoon, and that is that uh, I guess the law of unintended consequences comes out of this, you know. Uh, tiny changes in the system that um, seem minor at the time can be earth-shaking. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> burn, baby, burn. Huh? And I think that this is a message about biology that we in our hubris forget, that biology is uh, a staggeringly powerful natural force. Um, slower, maybe, but more uh, irresistible than giant tsunamis. And we understand it vastly less well. So biology, as we know it, kind of boils down into this. Um, at one level. Indulge me here. I know there's more to it. <laughs> I have a PhD. <laughs> I, know all the, I know all the complicated stuff. But really it boils down to this um, in terms of relationship from, of one organism to another. You can either parasitize something or have it parasitize you. You can eat it. It can eat you. Um, sort of have minimal exchange, although commensalism seems more rare. And it usually seems like it's on its way to symbiosis or possibly parasitism. And then you can have deep uh, coming together with endosymbiosis. And of course, Lynn Margulis, uh, in her early work, pointed this out. And as she told me once, I think she tried to get this published in her early years, something like 25 times or something. And now, of course, it's the, the paradigm that we all accept, that complex cells are actually a deep and obligatory symbiosis of other more uh, small and earlier organisms. So really what do those all boil down to? The, all of these associations are based on both energy and trophic economy of life. Who eats who and where is the energy flowing? This is really the, the name of the game. Um, what does that mean then when we're thinking about extraterrestrials? Well, what, what if you do 
But what if you do meet organisms that are very different? Uh, Chris's second genesis, or, or even like these guys, Silicon Life, which is one of my favorite pictures. We have no meaningful trophic energy relationship to these. And so we can't interact with them on the usual biological basis with which we, as organic evolution products, interact with other organisms. What we usually do is we ignore it, but planetary protection would not, would not allow us to do this. We can't ignore it. If we're going out to look for them, or if we're going to bring them here, then we have to relate to them. Well, we have big brains, and so one of the things that we do is make life a lot more complicated. And so you might say that our big brains and our, our complicated emotional structure has allowed us to create an entirely new class of relationship beyond these classical biological relationships, and that is aesthetics. And it was actually pointed out to me by a botany professor when I was an undergraduate that we are actually aesthetic parasites on plants, that we create big fluffy roses, not because it's intrinsically good for the rose family, but because we are heightening our aesthetic experience. So we're interfering, of course, with many other organisms and their fundamental biology for our own um, aesthetic enjoyment. And of course, there are more pragmatic things that we bring to the table in terms of our relationship. So with our technology, of course, we can now exploit biological and chemical properties of organisms. Who knows what this is? No guesses? You guys Lunch. need what? Lunch. Lunch? <laughs> you guys need remedial microbiology. This is a slime mold. And slime molds are products of, of life here on Earth, but they're one of the most alien kinds of in many of their properties that we have here on this planet. They come in a zillion forms. But the cool thing about them is that they're a model for organization unlike anything else. You know, we are made up of cells, and they get together as tissues, and then we have organs, and we have all of these structural complexities. Slime molds don't do that. They spend part of the time as individual cells in the environment, individual amoebic-like cells. But when certain circumstances in their environment change, they essentially come together and make instant tissue. They function at the tissue level. And this is an interesting model for life that very little life on this planet has actually taken. But you might think that that would be a very different uh, biological pathway down which an entire biosphere could be created. What triggers them to change from their individual form into the tissue form? Um, usually nutrient stress. Nutrient stress um, triggers aggregation, and then they all come together and they actually reproduce. Well, this it's is something that came to my mind when you were discussing all these things, and that is maybe one of the reasons we have aesthetics is that it, it allows us to do something pragmatic, which is, you know, as a life form, we can either be around a dead life form, which is waste, or a live life form, which is, quote, non-waste. And it's just a matter of whether the waste or the life is more toxic to my system <laughs> as to whether I want it dead or alive. And so live roses are better, and no, that's why we find them aesthetic? No, no, well, no, it's just a survival mechanism. You know, I mean, if, if you annihilate everything around you, you're living in a squalor of waste and rock. <laughs> you're living in L.A. And, you know, is what at you're some living. point, you have to, in a, in when you're enclosed in a niche, you have to make up your mind. Well, I can take this life form. It's, wor I, he's, it's far worse to me when it's dead. You know, and so you learn to, to do this because, you know, you, you can't really undermine the underpinnings, which is survival. Make a copy, make a copy, do it faster, do it faster. Sure. I actually think aesthetics, just because uh, my personal view of aesthetics is that we have this big brain that actually needs to function a lot, and we make stuff up. And, and it's a byproduct of the brain. What's my time, Chris? Uh, two minutes. Two minutes? Sorry, you can cut into discussion. Okay. <laughs> um, so perspective is. You know, we, we think of ourselves as the crown of creation, but really the microbial world thinks of all of us large organisms as just additional habitat. And you might argue that, that our, our stay on this planet has been quite transient in terms of the entire history of life. Um, our goal then is to uh, not be dispensable and actually to hold on to biology for much longer. So what are the stakes if we screw up on this extraterrestrial stuff? Um, I, I alternate between 
uh, thinking that um, I can't do anything about it, so why am I worrying about it, to being very, very uh, deeply concerned about it. And I think one thing that is overlooked is what, I'm th what I call the parable of the garden. Gardens are loved by humans. We love them. They appeal to our aesthetic senses. I guess they appeal to our sense of control, but really biology hates them, and anybody who gardens knows this. Um, you create a garden, and the act of creation is a lot of fun, and then you have to maintain them. And we have very short attention span. But biology, which is this overwhelming tidal wave of forces, goes on and on and on. And answers the question, why does a, car a garden become horribly overgrown like this? when biology actually takes hold and is self-sustaining um, versus the way it, it, my garden currently looks in New Mexico, where I have really not learned to garden yet, and where biology actually utterly fails. Biology is powerful when it works or it disappears. And this is an argument that Lovelock and uh, Margulis have advanced in support of their Gaian ideas about why they think life is not present on Mars. Because if it was present on a planet, it would be all over the planet. I'm not sure I believe in that part of it. But I do believe that the moral of the tale is that biology will always win. And that our idea of ordered nature is really an unstable state. And the critical thing is what you start, you can't stop biologically. We know this in terms of invasive species. We cannot think through the um, consequences of highly nonlinear coupled systems like biology and predict the outcome of what we start. And so when we actually start something, we need to accept, I believe, that we really immediately lose control of it. Um, so the current ethical focus is the care for existing life and to ensure the future for existing life. And we value life in proportion to the degree to which it resembles ourselves, which is not too surprising. So the last thing I want to discuss is whether or not there's anything else that we can say to get us out of what I view as an, an ethical conundrum. So I was casting around for a way to, to reframe the question. And what occurred to me in terms of extraterrestrial biospheres and whether, for example, in the specific case of Mars, one, one someday will find that it has microorganisms, and that's all, and how we should approach valuing them. And the notion that I distilled out of thinking about this was the idea of biotic potential. And that is that a, an, uh, a biosphere on a planet the snapshot that you see at any given time, that it actually is a representative of the entire biological potential of that planet over the entire history of biology on that planet. And if Earth at about one billion years uh, of age was visited by an alien, they would have concluded that there wasn't a whole lot here of biological interest, I think, unless they bought into the biotic potential idea. The planet was inhabited by um, very small beings. It was entirely microbial, and there wasn't a whole lot going on. And if they had not been sensitized to planetary protection issues, they would go, who cares? But on our own planet, we can see that we've developed this, this massively complicated biosphere that we now have. And so I think that I'm going to pursue this idea of potential and its future power as a justification for why one would preserve a biosphere no matter what its current state when you find it. Um, as an alternative to the way I usually approach as a scientist planetary protection issues, which is um, in the direction of not screwing up the science. And then my other more primitive notion is that I believe that life is and when you find it, then you should care for it no matter what it is. But I'm trying to find a more systematic way to actually approach this. So the questions that fall out of this is, is there anything here? Is this a notion that can actually be worked with and does it have any utility? I don't know. Can we quantify it? Can we look at a biosphere in its early stage of development and say anything about its potential to be life-bearing? 
course of the planet's history? Should we tr quantify it even if we can? Does it matter? Is there anything we can do to study this? Um, probably there is. And I'm not going to get to that this morning because I'm running out of time. Um, but is optimizing biotic potential a fundamental good in the sense in which Carl was talking about fundamental goods the other day? My inclination is yes, but then I already think that. I already, ha I already hold a fundamental, irreducible bias in favor of life and its value, no matter what its manifestation. We can bring this to the more near term and talk about what is the biotic potential of Mars. What is the biotic potential of Mars now? Or for example, under ecopoiesis, or this idea of biologically driven terraforming. And can we enhance it? This is one of uh, uh, Chris's points of view. And how would the biotic potential of Mars be affected by presence? Maybe not at all. I mean, that would my, be my happiest result. So I think with that, I will um, close and see if there are any more questions. That was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> was. You I do my best thinking on airplanes. It, it was awesome. Question. Um, I want to follow up on what Chris was doing yesterday since you did it today about maximizing uh, biotic potential. It seems to me that nature itself doesn't maximize biotic potential. If it did, there'd be a lot of maximization and then crashing. Maximization and then crashing. It I seems have a complicated to me, answer. It, it yeah. seems to me that um, Nature doesn't do that, and for a very good reason. I have a really long and complicated uh, view on this, and, and it derives from the fact that for oh, 25 years I've been working on, on and off, on the issue of Gaia. Um, is the Earth's system, in some sense, a cohesive cybernetic single system? And one of the big questions that comes out of that is how can you have biology optimizing itself when biology is internally in conflict and inconsistent? And I think that if you look at the history of life over the course of our planet's evolution, <laughs> that there have been certain trends. Not that it's an optimization, but there, has been in, in, there have been two major trends. There's been an in, increase in total niche space, total ways that organisms can live in the environment has increased over time. And the levels of complexity within the biosphere have been added. They're, they never go away. So when you invent eukaryotic cells, you don't make all the prokaryotic cells go away, right? When you invent multicellular uh, organisms, you don't make the simple things go away. So there's this constant increase of complexity levels within the system. And so that being the case, I think that you could make the argument on the, the basis of those two things that the total biotic potential has increased over time. Whether we've maximized that biotic potential, I don't know. I mean, I often say jokingly, but I'm only half joking, that, um, that prokaryotics or the microorganisms actually invented multicellular life so that they would have more habitat. And, and you can really think of it that way in terms of the system. Quick follow-up. If we maximize biotic potential, and, and I'm talking from the perspective of a community ecologist, population biologist, which is what I study, if we maximize biotic potential, it seems to me that we get rapidly to an unstable state, and lots of community ecology shows that, provided I understand what you mean by maximizing biotic potential. Bio you can't maximize right. biotic potential any more than you can maximize economic potential, pollution potential. I mean, we want a not stable, on a, sustainable Not on system. a subgrid scale basis. So within the system, you have regions of greater and lesser stability. So all that's going on. When I'm talking about biotic potential, I am talking about it at the very highest planetary level. Okay, but then that, okay, I think that's right. But then the net yeah. consequence is there are absolutely no theoretical, biological uh, parameters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that can tell you how to deal with that, much less predict it. The biology is simply not good enough. So even if we wanted to maximize biotic potential, we know so little.
There are virtually no basic laws, say, in ecology, almost none. Right. We couldn't do it even if we wanted to, which means if we try, we're going to muck up, at least now. Well, you know, it's a given precept that I have that we're just going to muck up. So, well, so I released myself from worrying about that don't end Don't add of it. to the muck. I mean, <laughs> well, but I'm not sure that it's adding to the muck. Um, No, and I, I actually think that there's a major issue here, and that is that I really do not believe that the way to understand biology is through biology. Uh, I really think that the way to understand biology is in the mathematics of complex systems. Um, for example, Stephen Wolfram's uh, new kind of science stuff, NKS stuff. Looking at the complexity of biological creation is so mind-boggling and so fantastically detailed and as biologists, we've been through that, thinking that if we just ate enough data, we'd eventually poop out fundamental principles, you know. But I, I don't see that happening except on a very regional, a very localized way. And what we need is to understand how complex systems organize themselves, no matter what the players, whether it's biological entities or something else, right, economies. And, and so I really think that you know, while all of us are working on the biology, and that's important, that the fundamental insights are going to come from an end run around this. And, and maximizing biotic potential of a solar system, for example, becomes a question, right? So th thinking about our exporting our kinds of life to Mars, or as Chris has suggested, taking any remnant biology on Mars and actually echo synthesizing the, the planet so that that intrinsic biology can optimize itself more than it can without a little help. All of those are in the direction of increasing biotic potential. Um, you know, when, as an individual organism, you increase your biotic potential by successfully producing young, right? If you, if you die before you reproduce, you've truncated your biotic potential. Well, I think you can apply the same kind of notion to whole planets and, in fact, whole solar systems. So then, then and it's been suggested by others, this is not my original idea, if Earth transports its life to another body, then we are essentially a planet, cybernetic planet system in the act of reproduction. So, okay. yeah. You know, yeah. I, I think the, the problem isn't that you want to improve things. The problem is when you talk about maximization and optimization. Because as you just said, these things are very complex. And when you have systems like a solar system where they Earth and Mars interact only very weakly mm -hmm. with each other. How the hell are you going to maximize those two systems when they're so? You're going to get a sub-optimization maybe on Earth and a sub-optimization, but your theory then fails. So the, what Herb Simon has shown for human beings, we don't optimize, we satisfy, we do good enough. And so when we have mm -hmm. kids, we don't try to have the maximum number of kids. Because the birthing of babies is just the start. You got you want to do good enough on the baby so you can raise most. Well, yeah, that's just so, en energetic ecology. No, but, but energy the trouble ecology. is when you say maximization, you are implying that the no, good I'm not of using maximization. I said optimization, optimization, which implies is the same thing. optimization is not the same as maximization. Same Get some Simon and read about satisficing. It's, it's, it's a very liberating thing. And yeah, can, I'm not saying that we're optimizing in the direction of some ideal state. I'm saying that optimizing is the most life you can get for whatever you have on hand. That, that's optimization. That Maximization would be. would be creating the maximum amount of life you could have. Well, I, I guess I'm just continuing the same discussion. I, I like the idea of thinking in terms of, of um, I thought you did use the term maximizing biotic potential. But I don't think so. I didn't intentionally do okay. that because but I don't believe in maximization. I believe that all organisms are not you, optimized. You wanted to increase yeah. biotic potential. Yeah, uh, cr increasing um, biotic potential over time and distributing it more widely. But the... the I mean, there's a, there's a conceptual problem with even studying potential. I, mean, I agree. Potency is just a relationship to act, or to actuality. Right. And, and why not just say you 
to increase bio biological actuality rather than potential. I'm not sure what, what well, you're gaining by I'm actually talking thinking, about potential. I'm thinking from the point of view of an astrobiological perspective. And how do we value a biosphere or even a relict biosphere that we might find on a planet like Mars? Where you look at it, I mean, Bob Zubrin, who I argue extensively yeah. with all the time on this issue. Bob is a completely urban guy. I don't think he ever saw a tree before he was 35, right? <laughs> really, he's a great guy, but he has no feeling for the natural world at all. And this is, I guess, a byproduct of growing up in New York. But, <laughs> You know, so he has a worldview that is very human-centered. So Bob's view on terraforming and going to Mars and all this stuff is who cares if there's bacteria there? Who cares if there's anything there? Um, but particularly bacteria and, and the kind of organisms that I study and value and that I think are intrinsically important. He doesn't value them at all because he looks at, a, you know, some, the idea of a, some pathetic relict biosphere on Mars in the subsurface, for example, um, of microorganisms, and he goes, who cares? This is, uh, you know, a value of irrelevance to the central value of humanity. And so the idea of assessing another extraterrestrial object for its entire biotic potential over the lifetime of the planet seems to me to be able to get you to say, well, it isn't just the remnant of life you're looking at now, it's the entire right. biological okay. here's potential. A, here's a way I would propose to rephrase your point, which again, I like. I'm just trying to struggle to the foundation for being able to support life rather than potential. You see, potential just seems to me to have an ontological or conceptual problem. Hmm, maybe. See, okay. I'm thinking of it in terms of physics terms. Right. <laughs> Potential so, energy, you know, yeah. I, I get that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But, uh, anyway, I, yeah. Well, I mean, I put this together as an exercise in trying to think through this stuff myself. It's hardly a finished work or a finished thought, even. Yeah. Um, the word optimization in the mathematical sense is always done with respect to some particular variable. There are value judgments that you must make before you optimize anything. Precisely. And that, that's just a comment. Now it's sort of right. a question here. Have you thought about, you, know, you talked about chaos theory briefly, or you mentioned it as yeah. part of the foundation. What about non-equilibrium thermodynamics? It seems to me there's some very interesting concepts there. There's sure. the idea of the spontaneous formation of dissipative structures, of least production of entropy. Sure. Um, these, are, these are sort of abstract goals. But uh, I think they indicate what life does. Yes, and, and they indicate, I think, um, as, a, as all of biological creation does, they indicate biology's unique power to actually not defeat thermodynamics in the end, but to do very creative end run and um, uh, manipulations of thermodynamics right, to sort of stretch the good part and minimize the that's least production of entropy. And that's exactly. A, that's a, a yeah. powerful concept, yeah. which uh, yeah. probably to be fleshed out and applied precisely would require a lot more thought than we will have time in our lifetimes to give it. Yeah, or neurons to, or, or neurons. neuronal connections to actually um, bathe it with. I agree. Okay, one last question. Um, it's hard for me to think about biotic potential with, without thinking about at expense of Right. I mean, it, it. Sure. In principle, if 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 we Expense. could preserve biotic potential, we we want to do that. Then that's an easy choice. But but, and I'm I'm trying. You know, th this is the problem with the 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 ethical stuff. From my point of view, I kind of take a somewhat cynical view too, because I can you, immediately you start coming up with examples. Well, what if? What if? Right. Of okay. Course. But that's reality. So now we we decide. Yeah. You know, it's a good idea to preserve biotic potential. Um, I remember when the Martian meteorite fossil stuff was going on, I'm trying to explain this to my dad, and he looks at me, this was before we knew it, you know, there was no hope, looks at me and says, it's not like they found a mouse on Mars. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. And, what, and I'm tr so I'm trying to explain the biotic potential and right, how exciting right. this the is. The intrinsic wonderfulness of and, uh, little and tiny squiggly things. And that's fine if preserving yeah. it isn't, we don't have to give up something else to right. do it. But, but let's say we were, at, we're on Mars, and it turns out that in, in, some, in some way we can't 
uh, we can't spread humanity there, and for some reason we really need to do that, unless we wipe out the biotic potential. Okay, then what do we do? You know, what if that biotic potential is threatening to us? There, there's, a, there's an analogy, Connie, right? Uh, if you're a, a poor uh, Maasai group, and you're living on the fringes of a national park, and you go in there and you, you poach bush meat, you're doing it in a, in a drought, and you're doing it for the survival of your family. To me, as a human being, that's a higher ethical good than having those people starve, even though it's impinging on the ethical good of having preserves where the total biotic potential of that part of Africa is actually preserved. And it's a difficult question. I think the only way we can operationally approach this is to try to avoid those conflicts and that's a whole other ethical conference. <laughs> so, okay, right. thanks. Thank you. <laughs> okay, some good.